about um, 18 years ago I got involved in genetics and at that time I was at Lund University in southern Sweden and some epidemiologists wanted cooperation with mathematicians on, on uh, uh, genetic risk factors of different kinds of diseases like uh, cancer and uh, diabetes. And then more recently I moved to Stockholm and nine, nine years ago I started cooperation with biologists, more precisely conservation biologists. And they want to prevent species from getting extinct. And one risk factor is genetic because accumulation of inbreeding over time is a major risk factor because then inheritable diseases may spread. And that's really uh, on, on, and that theory is based on population genetics. So I had to learn population genetics, not only genetic risk factors today, but also how the genetic composition of a population evolves over time. And that is really the mathematics of microevolution. And I, 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 I would like to say also that population genetics was founded 100 years ago, almost in the 20s and 30s, by three very prominent British uh, scientists, Ronald Fisher, Sewell Wright and J.B.S. Haldane. And uh, uh, their theory how the genetic composition of populations evolves over time was a basis for the new synthesis of uh, uh, Huxley and others in the 40s and 50s. They built upon the work of these mathematicians. So in that way they married uh, Darwin's evolutionary theory with genetics. However, then at that time very little was known about the complexity of, 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 of life and of the uh, living cell and so on. So I think today we can sort of use population, I think population genetics is still an excellent tool for mi microevolution to describe small uh, changes within species, some limited species formation, but in my view, it has problem uh, to explain larger uh, macroevolutionary uh, changes, how new structures appear and things like that. So in my view, we can actually use population genetics today for the opposite purpose, showing how unlikely macroevolution is to point towards the gaps of macroevolutionary theory. But so that is sort of the critique part, but today I will talk about a project which tries to be more positive and, 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 and construct an alternative. Let's try to build an ancestry of, human, of humanity that starts with Adam and Eve. Uh, and I will talk about a little how I got into this. Uh, and uh, this is really ongoing work, so I will not tell you, because we haven't really checked this with data yet, so I would tell you about the principles of this model and how it contrasts with the usual <coughs> model where we share common descent with chimps and other species. So uh, it really started when I attended the first forum in 2010 and then I met Peter Loos who couldn't come this week uh, uh, and uh, the next year I came back to the forum 2011 I came and then I Peter invited me to uh, an intelligent design conference in, in the UK and already at that time I've started to doubt uh, evolutionary theory but I simply wanted to learn more in, in order to have a firm standpoint and one thing led to the other so uh, I met other people in 2012 I met Anne Gauger at another ID conference in Copenhagen and she said that what about trying to use population genetics you're a mathematician should we try to build a uh, uh, a model where humanity uh, starts from a first pair. And this project really started two years later, 2014, and uh, we published two papers on the model uh, uh, two years ago in the Biocomplexity. It's an ID journal, and then we also have two chapters in the book, uh, Theistic Evolution, a Scientific, Philosophical and Theological Critique. And so the, the and uh, Andrew Jones, uh, he's a very skilled programmer, he's in, involved in this. So uh, Biologic Institute is part of Discovery, and then Colin Reeves at Coventry and Richard Bax at Queen's Mary University, London. So I would like to give you some outline of the talk. So I will briefly mention the, the 
pr the dominating model in academia today, which is part of Darwinian macroevolution, according to which we our closest relative uh, uh, is the chimps. So, uh, and how does this model look like in more detail? And then the, the other contrasting unique origin model of humanity. And uh, so, and, and in this project, we are sort of we're not using fossils data, paleontology, and so on. So we only concentrate on genetic data. So what has what does genetics have to say about human history? Uh, and uh, we, in this project, we are mainly looking at so far uh, genetic data of humans because we so we are so the goal is sort of can we build a unique origin model of humanity if it try, if it if it fits data well well then a unique origin cannot be ruled out so then in the long run you should also look at DNA of humans and chimps and try to compare the unique origin model with a with a common descent model so and uh, so it's a huge amount of data we have a uh, in, in each of our cell nuclei, we have a number of chromosomes, a total of 3 billion nucleotides. Uh, and we have uh, differences among us at, sev at several million places. And then if we have a data set of 1,000 individuals, that's a lot of data. So we, we, we have first have, have to summarize this data in some way. And then we, that's, that's the first part. And then, we, and then it's uh, population genetics comes in. Given data, we want to propose a history of humanity. Uh, even within un unique origin, there are many enormous amounts of par parameters to vary. When did the first couple live? Uh, how did the population size vary over time? What was the geographic uh, dispersion pattern over time? All, th all these things can be varied. So, so uh, um, and through time, then we use a number of mechanisms of population genetics, and the two most well-known are mutations and natural selection, but there are others. Mutation generates new diversity, and natural selection selects some of the variants that are generated by mutations. And there, there are some other mechanisms that shuffles around the, the variation that exists. Uh, but I will also talk about another mechanism which is unique to this model that God may have created Adam and Eve with diversity in the first place and that, so that is sort of and we are not the first to suggest this uh, kind of mechanism but we are sort of building it into a, a, a large mathematical model uh, a bit more consistently but I, I will not give you any formulas today so it leaves you more I will explain things by picture so it's more be an overview of ideas. But you can look into these two papers if you want to dig into this more in more detail and see a lot of uh, references to other papers. So we will actually, if we have some human history model, starting from Adam and Eve, and then we simulate the genomes of Adam and Eve because we don't have genetic data from them, and then it evolves over time using these mechanisms of change, mutations, natural selection, everything, until the present generation when we have data, and then we check how well does the simulated data uh, fit with the observed data using these sum summarizing statistics. And then we do that a number of times, simulate a number of times, and the best human history model has the best fit between observed data and simulated data. So that's sort of the general idea. And then I would end uh, asking, I, I will be a bit more philosophical at the end, so why should we test a unique origin model in the first place? So I will give a philosophical, an empirical, and a theological motivation, and, and Alexander has already given the theological motivation to some extent, so I will just follow on. But So let's start with the common descent model. So uh, then the human and chimpanzee lineages split around six million years ago. This estimate varies a bit, but of that size. And then along the human lineage, lineage uh, Homo erectus evolved in Africa. Uh, and then it spread to other continents from Africa 
to Europe and Asia and other continents about two million years ago. And then that lineage split about 500,000 years ago or a little bit more to Neanderthals and humans, for instance. So that's the general uh, sort of uh, structure, but it, this theory actually comes in two versions. So one theory is the multi-regional evolution. Uh, so, and according to this model, humanity arose in parallel at different continents when Homo erectus uh, migrated out of Africa two million years ago. Whereas the other, which has been the more popular theory, is uh, the out of Africa theory. And according to this theory, uh, our ancestor moved out from uh, descendants of Homo erectus moved out from Africa much more recently, about 50,000 years, and then conquered the world, so to speak. Whereas the other earlier descendants of Homo erectus that migrated out of Africa, they sort of were, uh, they got extinct. But how were, the, the last 10 years, the, uh, there has been, it has been made possible to genotype ancient DNA, like Neanderthal DNA and things like that. And then it, it, it's found that uh, we actually share a lot of DNA with Neanderthals. And according to the common descent model, then the solution is, well, there has been some interbreeding with Neanderthals. So that is sort of a hybrid of these two models. So we actually, we have the out of Africa model. So our ancestors, according to this model, came out of Africa here, but they, there was still some Neanderthals alive and there was some interbreeding, although the Neanderthals came out of Africa much earlier. So, so so that was a, a common descent model. And now, I mean, if we have a unique origin model, as I said, you can vary parameters in so many ways. I will just give you two possible, uh, possible two possibilities. I mean, humans descend from one single man and woman, and this couple had no further ancestors. So they were created uniquely. Uh, and uh, we could think of, this would be like, like the uh, old Earth creationist model in some sense, uh, where, and we could also couple this to geography it, in order to make it a bit similar to the out of Africa theory. Because our, after all, the out of Africa model is uh, the best fitting model given that you have a common descent assumption. So it's reasonable to make a, uh, just to think now the validation work is going on, but it's reasonable to think that a unique origin model has some similar features uh, because we have to fit data as well. So it could be then, according to this model, that the first couple lived in Africa and then migrated out of Africa to Middle East and then to other continents. In much the same way as in the out of Africa model. The difference is that this, this first couple is it does not descend from Homo erectus, but the, it was created uniquely. Uh, I mean, I guess according to some young Earth creation models, there was only one continent from the beginning, and then there was a continental drift. But we could think of starting with after the time of Noah, then, would be like uh, the first couple uh, lived in the Middle East somehow, and then the dispersion pattern is more, is, is more or less the same, but this arrow goes in the other direction. And this model has several advantages. A disadvantage here is the African DNA actually looks older. And I would not have time to go into that. But uh, uh, there, there, so there are pros and cons of both models. Uh, and, the, uh, and the advantage of this model is that, according to John Sanford and others, our genome is actually uh, eroding over time because natural selection cannot uh, take away all slightly deleterious mutations. So that would point to a younger, uh, uh, younger origin of humanity. Uh, so let's now look at genetic data. So I will m mainly look at the unique origin model now. But uh, then in the long run, one should ask whether the unique origin model or the uh, or the uh, common descent model explains data uh, best. So, since we will mainly look at the history of humanity and not compare 
uh, with the common descent model, it's, it's sufficient to look at DNA differences among humans. Is it possible to fit a human history model that explains all the difference, genetic differences between us? Is that possible? Then in the long run, we should also look at, if we want to compare this model with the common descent model, we should also look at DNA differences between humans and chimps and among chimps. I will mention a little bit about that. <laughs> So let's look at uh, genetic data. In each of our cell nuclei, we have 46 chromosomes, 22 pairs of non-sex chromosomes. Uh, males have one X and one Y chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes. And uh, these are all written in a four-letter alphabet. Nucleotides, which is three billions long altogether. And, uh, we also have uh, DNA in the, in the cell plasma, ring-formed mitochondria. There are several of them, and they are much shorter, only 16,000 nucleotides. So, what is it that makes us genetically different? Well, there are many, and th these are called polymorphisms. And there are many types of polymorphisms. But I will, insertions, deletions, I will look at the most uh, common type of polymorphism when there is a change in the single letter, in the single nucleotide. And uh, let's look at a small portion of chromosome 1 in one individual. Let's say it's a double strand. So one strand is coding for proteins and the other it carries the same information because the T always pairs with an A and the C with a G. So we might as well look at only the coding strand. So this is a small portion of chromosome 1, let's say, from one individual. And then we look at the same portion. Uh, individuals have different DNA strings, so there are variations in some nucleotides. So let's look at some other individual which has a difference at this nucleotide. Instead of a T, there is a C. And this is called a SNP, because the polymorphism, the difference, is at a single nucleotide. And now, this is only two individuals, but let's look at the whole human population or a sample of 1,000 individuals. Let's say that, because most SNPs only have two alleles, two variants in the population. So let's say that every, each individual actually has two copies of chromosome 1, but uh, let's say that there is always a T or C in this population. And it turns out that 40% have the T and 60% have the C then we say that 40% is a minor allele frequency. And then we can redo this for all SNPs, and there are quite many of them. There are several million of them along the human genome. But remember, there is a total of 3 billion nucleotides, so there is variation among humans in about 0 0.08 nucleotides. So we are genetically very similar. So this is how much we differ. Of course, uh, uh, the Swedes are genetically more similar and, and uh, the Germans and so on, but if we look at the, all humans, it's on, this is the, the, the amount of difference there is on average. Uh, then uh, we can, I could say a little bit about chimps. They have one more chromosome, but they have two short versions of, of, of uh, chromosome 2. If you put them next to it, each other and try to align the chimpanzee and human genomes, you find out that when, when the chimpanzee genome was sequenced in 2005, it was believed that there was a 1% difference. But it really depends on how you align the two sequences and how you count differences. So a so more reasonable estimate is actually 5%. And it, that sounds quite small, but uh, uh, these differences are very important because uh, humans have genes that are lacking in, in chimp, chimps and vice versa, and there's a lot, many differences in terms of gene expression, which genes are active in different tissues, and especially when it concerns the brain. They're, they're quite, so these differences are very important, and I, I would say hard to explain for macroevolutionary theory, but that's really another talk. So uh, um, I will go back now to talking about, now we have talked about genetic data. How do we summarize them in a convenient way? We have 3 billion 
uh, nucleotides and about a few million of them uh, at a few million of them we are different, the SNPs. And how do we summarize them by convenient numbers? Well, the first summary statistic is simply to take this nucleotide diversity. It's one single number. It's the fraction of nucleotides where we differ. And it's about 0.08% among humans, 0.13% among chimps, and 5% between humans and chimps. And now, this has something to say about human history. Uh, because uh, if we have a large population, there is more variation. A smaller population has lower variation. And it is typically argued that a young population should have a small diversity. And it's argued that, well, this looks small, but it said, what is it that generates diversity? Well, mutations, and they happen so rarely that this is too large to have a young age of humanity. That's the argument. But if we allow Adam and Eve to be created with diversity, things could change. So I, I would come back to that. But it's, we cannot simply use this summary statistics. I mean, we, we are throwing away so much information if we are only trying to fit models using one single number. And the other summary statistics, they are more complicated, but they, uh, this is a single number. Uh, the second, this is called allele frequency spectrum. And remember, we have several million SNPs. These are nucleotides where we differ. And we, remember, we, I showed you a portion of chromosome 1 and took the example that 40% had a T or 60% had a C. So 40% had the minor allele frequency. Uh, and then we can redo this for all SNPs along the human genome. And each SNP has a minor allele frequency. And that's the number between 0 and 50%, because the other allele has a larger frequency, so the smaller frequency has to be less than 50%. So we actually take all these several million SNPs and, put, uh, and, and uh, draw a histogram of all these minor allele frequencies. And that histogram is called the allele frequency spectrum. And the shape of this spectrum has something to tell us about human history. That's the idea. And I will just give you the sort of main ideas here. If you have an old population, then this spectrum will typically have more rare alleles, whereas a young population will have a flatter allele frequency spectrum. And then the third kind of uh, summary statistics has to do with looking at several positions along the genome at the same time. And it's quite remarkable that our genomes are mosaics of different blocks. And these blocks are on the average, they vary in length, but their average length is about 10,000 uh, nucleotides. So let's take one example. Let's take a portion of chromosome 1. Individual 1 has two copies of chromosome 1. At the first block, that person has inherited the yellow and the green variant of that block. And the, at the second uh, block, uh, that person has, has inherited the pink and the blue variant of that block, and then the green and blue variant of that block, and so on. And whereas the second individual has inherited different variants of those blocks. And this also carries some information about human history, because a young population tends to have longer blocks, and uh, an old population tends to have smaller blocks. And be because there's something called recombination that chops up these blocks into smaller pieces. And if we have a very old population, there's been more time to chop up the, these mosaics into smaller pieces. So now we have, you could actually have more summary statistics, but these are the three that we are so, so far using in our product. Nucleotide diversity, the allele frequency spectrum, which has to do with how many common SNPs are there and how many rare, and this has to do with the length of the blocks. But when I say nucleotide diversity tells something about human history, allele frequency spectrum tells us about something about human history, and the block length does as well, well, here population genetics comes in in order to make those statements. 
And uh, as I said in the beginning of my talk, population genetics is used, really using mathematics to describe how the genetic makeup or composition of a population evolves or changes over time. So, uh, and, uh, so, and we want to infer the most likely human history given the DNA data we have today. Uh, and uh, this history will look differently depending on which type of DNA we look at. So if we look at Y chromosomes, only males have Y chromosomes, then it's actually an ancestral male tree of DNA. If we look at mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited from the mother, we get an ancestral female tree. And they will look uh, a bit different. Uh, uh, and it's more complicated for non-sex chromosomes, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 22, or, and the X chromosomes, because both females and males have these chromosomes. And uh, there is, when I inherit DNA from my father, from uh, let's say chromosome 1, part of, of, of uh, my chromosome 1 from my father comes from my grandmother and part comes from my grandfather. And the points of, and these are recombination points where there is a switching. And this also has an uh, impact on how the ancestral tree looks because because of these recombination points there will be the lineages when we go backwards in time will take a different route. So we have different ancestral trees over different uh, genomic regions. So it's more complicated to look at. Uh, that's why people started to look at uh, the ancestry for Y chromosome and mitochondrial D DNA at the, at the end of the 80s. And then more recently, the last 10-15 years, people have looked at, at uh, non-sex and X chromosome DNA as well. So uh, now I will talk about these mechanisms of change. I already mentioned two for you, the most well, two mass, most well known, mutations and natural selection. So uh, mutations, they happen very rarely. Uh, let's say of the order 10 to minus 8 per nucleotide per generation. So if you go from, when, uh, from parent to, to child, at each nucleotide, there is a probability of 10 to minus 8 of a misprint. It's a very small probability, but we also have a long genome. It's several billions long. So on the average, there is around between 100 and, uh, and 10 misprints for each time a, a, a sperm or ova cell is formed. And these are really mutations when a sperm or ova cell, a germ cell, is formed. So let's say that this is part of a chromosome of the, let's say, uh, the mother, and we have a C here, and then when the, when the ova cell is formed, we have a change from a C to a T. So this is part of the, the egg cell, uh, the ova cell, and when that unites with a sperm cell, we have a fertilized cell with a T in this position and st instead of C, and then that's through ordinary cell division, that mutation spreads to, to, to the whole, to, to, to all cells of, of, of the child. And we also have somatic mutations that happen in grown-up individuals in, in some tissues, and it often gets, gives rise to cancer. But that's another kind of mutation. These are mutations in, uh, in, in the sperm or ova cells, because they, they are inherited to to, to the coming generation and spread to all cells of the, of, of, of the child. So, and then the second uh, mechanism is called genetic drift. And because of, uh, because of chance, some alleles will spread more often from the parents to the children. And let's take, uh, it's easier to illustrate if we look at Y chromosomes, because then we can think of a male population of 10 individuals in the first generation. Let's say that uh, nine of them have, the C, have a C in this position and one has a T. And this father, he, gets, he has two sons, and these two sons have three sons all together, and these three sons have two sons, and they have one son. So we see that the frequency of T fluctuates up and down simply by chance. And sooner or later, either the C or the T will die out, but it takes quite a long time. But, uh, but we see that the effect of genetic drift is to remove variation. Uh, 
that was created by mutations. But it takes quite a long time. But if it's a, a large population, it takes even longer time. Then natural selection, that's the third, third mechanism. It's more or less it's similar to genetic drift. It's only that one of the alleles has a selective advantage and it will sort of take over the population more quickly. So let's say that T has a selective advantage. In the same example, we have this male population. This is part of the Y chromosome. So the T has a selective advantage and so this father has three children. They have five children altogether and so on. And quite soon the T has taken over and, uh, uh, and uh, because T is more fit and the C uh, variant disappears from the population. Then we have the fourth um, uh, mechanism of, of uh, change and that is called recombination. And I, t I mentioned that this is switching between inheritance from my grandmother and from my grandfather and uh, um, and it simply shuffles around diversity that, that is already in place. So it com recombines the uh, diversity along the chromosomes. So uh, let's look at two homologous chromosomes. Two we, we, we all have two copies of each non-sex uh, non chromosome. Let's say that these are two copies of chromosome 1 in a male and then we have two sperm cells are formed here. And then in the first sperm cell, uh, here we have a recombination point and DNA is inherited from, let's say that this is the grandfather. This is a child, this is DNA in the, in the father, and this one comes from the grandfather and from the grandmother. So we have DNA from the grandmother to the left of this point, and from, from the grandfather to the left of this point, and from the grandmother to the right of this point. And from, for the other sperm cell, it's the other way around. And we see that there is along this uh, sperm, uh, in chromosome one of this sperm cell, a G is now combined with a C. So that's a recombination because earlier there was a G, G going with a T and an A with a C. So that's where the name comes from. And we see that this shuffles around diversity and combines it in new ways. It doesn't create new diversity and it really doesn't remove diversity, it shuffles around it. And then there is also, uh, I mean, people move around and they colonate different regions, so we get sort of genetic differences between, that's why we look a bit different in different parts of the world, and the, the more these dif regions are isolated, the larger are the genetic differences, and the more we migrate between uh, different parts of the world, the less are the genetic differences. So let's take an example of one again with a, with a male population of Y chromosome. Let's say that we have 10 individuals in the first generation. Four of them live in Europe, six in Africa. In this position all Europeans have a C here and all the Africans have a T. So there is a large geographic difference for that particular SNP. And then uh, the son of that father moves to Africa and the son of this father moves to Europe and that and now the there is a smaller difference in terms of the frequency of C and T between Europeans and Africans but on the other hand if if there is isolation uh, the, the, these differences are enlarged uh, it goes the other way uh, and the same happens if uh, we have colonization of new areas with we uh, so uh, Normally, in population genetics, when people try to fit common descent models, they only have basically these five principles. And this is the one that generates new information, new diversity. These two sort of removes diversity. This one does it slowly, this one does it quickly. And these two sort of shuffles around information, either along the chromosomes or along between geographic regions. I've written this one in capital letters because it's the only mechanism that generates no, new diversity. But now we have a sixth mechanism, created diversity. So Adam and Eve could have been created with diversity. And we are not the first to propose this. There are several young Earth creationists, uh, Robert Carter and John Sanford, who have suggested this as well. But we are putting it into sort of a, 
a mathematical model which is also quite fast to simulate from. Uh, and let me just illustrate this. Let's look at again my favorite chromosome 1. Uh, let's say that here is Adam's two copies of chromosome 1 and Eve's two copies of chromosome 1. And here I have illustrated with three nucleotides, the blue, the black and the red one. At the blue one we have created diversity because there are four copies of this uh, chromosome. Two of them are blue and one... Uh, no, uh, two, uh, three of them have an A and one has a T. So there is diversity. And the same happens for the red SNP. We have three C and one G. Whereas there is no diversity uh, in, at the black nucleotide. All four copies have a G. Now Adam and Eve have a son. And now we see that there is diversity at all three nucleotides. What has happened? Well, here the diversity that already existed in the first generation was simply inherited to the sun. At this position we had a T from here and we had an A from here actually. And the, at this place we had a C from uh, here and we had a G from here. However, this diversity, we see that the, this, uh, this allele came from here and this one came from here. We have two G's, but then here, when the ovum cell was formed from e in Eve, there was a germline mutation. So at this locus we have a germline mutation and at these two, at this nucleotide we have a germline mutation and at these two nuclei we have a created diversity. And then we see that in the beginning most variation will be due to, uh, to created diversity because mutations happen so, so, so infrequently. But as time goes by, the number of germline mutations will accumulate. And if, uh, and if uh, humanity is old, most of the diversity we see today will be due to mutations, just as for a common descent model. Whereas if uh, uh, Adam and Eve lived more recently, most of the variation will be due to variation that was already in place from, from uh, when, when God created Adam and Eve. Uh, so, uh, and I will talk a little bit about now how to, uh, very briefly now. Now we have these, all these mechanisms, so we now want to simulate, uh, uh, we, we want to propose a certain human history and then we want to simulate genetic data a large number of times and fit that to observe data. So in principle it could be like this propose a, a history of humans and chimps, or if we only look at humans, uh, and then we, we want to generate sim simulated summary statistics. Remember, we had nucleotide diversity, we had allele frequency spectrum, and we had block length. And we want to simulate those a large number of times and compare that with observed data. But in order to do that, we first have to simulate all DNA. Uh, throughout all generations and then simulate it uh, and, and, and then summarize it. So if we have a unique origin model, we only and look at humanity only, we first simulate the DNA of the first couple and then we propagate their DNA using these five mechanisms that are usually used in, in, in population genetics to change the genetic makeup to the present generation. And we use a six mechanism or to create diversity for Adam and Eve. And then we summarize uh, that uh, DNA of humans to get these summary statistics. Actually, I will not have time to go into this, but one, uh, one uh, twist with our model is that we actually, uh, we actually build the tree backwards in time, because then you, for, uh, you don't, it's a much faster algorithm. You don't have to generate the whole human history then. You only have to generate, simulate DNA for all individuals in the past that have, that, that are ancestors of, some, of someone. And that gives you a much quicker algorithm. But the, uh, this is, whether you do this forward or backwards in time is the same principle. So we simulate summary statistics many times. Let's take nucleotide diversity 
for instance. We, we have the observed value 0.08% and then we, let's say that we make 10,000 simulations, we get a histor histogram of simulated nucleotide diversity. So a, a well-fitting model, this histogram should be centered around the observed value. Uh, but, uh, but whereas a, a model that works less well has a histogram maybe somewhere here or somewhere here, and then we do the same for the allele frequency spectrum. That would look more complicated. But then the whole spectrum here should be simulated many times. And those uh, simulated spectra should be close to what we observe. So, uh, uh, and, and based on this, we try to fit the best model. And this is ongoing work, really. And remember, there are, e even within the unique origin model, there is enormous amount of parameters when we, so when I say propose history, well, when did Adam and Eve live? How did the population size change? What is, uh, how, how, how did people move between different geographic regions and so on? I gave you this, this world map with two scenarios in terms of geographic dispersal and so on, but there are lots of, but that's also good news for uh, a unique origin model, because if there are so many parameters to vary, it's more likely to find at least one model that fits quite well. Uh, so, um, and then you could de do this, of course, for a common descent model, but then you need start with DNA from a common ancestor, and then it spreads to DNA of humans and chimps, and, and then we propagate that all the way down to the present generation to get summary statistics of DNA for you. you for humans and for chimps. But we, then we cannot use creative diversity because it's not an allowed principle to use uh, if we have this approach. So let me then finish and be a bit more philosophical. And uh, uh, so why should we fit a unique origin model in the first place? And uh, so far, it's only common descent models that have been uh, tried. And I think the reason is that uh, uh, creative diversity, that is sort of a, uh, it has a flavor of being a supernatural feature. And in, in the, the reigning paradigm in, in, in science is met methodological naturalism, where only natural explanations are allowed. So then not all models are allowed to compete on equal grounds. And that means that uh, if you have that principle well, then uh, testing such a model is pseudoscience. It's not allowed according to that principle. So, uh, uh, so, I, uh, so, uh, so far, only common descent models have been validated with real data. And we should also allow a, a unique origin model to be tested and see if it works. But we should not exclude it from the beginning just because it has a, some supernatural flavor e in it or some, some mechanisms that, that sort of, uh, that God uh, all of a sudden creates uh, the, the, the genomes of Adam and Eve. Then I had sort of an empirical motivation, and, and this is all now ongoing work, so I shouldn't be too definite here because we haven't really validated uh, data yet, but uh, I could say some things. I think that uh, a unique origin of model makes very good sense of the fact that we have a block structure of DNA, which is quite remarkable. And it seems that these blocks, many of them come in three, four, or five versions. And it's remarkable that for all uh, non-sex chromosomes, there were four copies in Adam and Eve altogether. So it could be that this mosaic is a mosaic of the, of the chromosomes of Adam and Eve. And all these switching points between the blocks are Reco some ancestral recombinations that happened in the past. Uh, people that work, there are also other um, explanations that uh, so-called recombination hotspots, that recombination happens, even if you have a common descent uh, explanation, recombination happens more often in some regions. And the, you can actually get the mosaic structure all, also with a, a common descent. Uh, explanation. So that remains to be seen. But it, it's very interesting that we have this feature. Uh, so it, it has quite a lot of uh, or unique origin flavor into it. Then I would say, uh, I, I'm not a biologist, but uh, 
the, the sort of reigning out of Africa model, now we have some hybrid with, with the interbreeding with Neanderthals, but the typical model says that before humanity went of, uh, out of Africa, there was a severe reduced pop population size, only a few thousand individuals for several thousand years. And it's well known in genetics that if you have a small population for a long time, uh, um, recessive uh, uh, disorders will spread, uh, or inbreeding will, will uh, accumulate over time. Uh, and uh, and uh, so that might be a potential problem with uh, uh, that model, that, that it faces, uh, um, yeah, uh, that it faces uh, problems with inbreeding depression. But then you might say, well, if humanity started with Adam and Eve, that's an even smaller population size of only two. Isn't that a more severe bottleneck? And if we have a young Earth assumption and we have Noah and, and uh, his wife and uh, the, the wives of his three children, they, these are five people, that's, an e that's a quite very small bottleneck again. But we could think of this is a very short-lasting bottleneck. And if you have a bottleneck that lasts for only a few generations, it's not that severe. And uh, we can also think that at least it's in principle possible that God created this diversity with no harmful mutations. Uh, uh, whereas the germline mutations that come along later on, they are sort of misprints and many of them are slightly deleterious. Whereas we can think of at least, it's possible to, to imagine that the creative diversity was, uh, uh, we had, a, God loves diversity, so he creates diversity from the beginning, but no deleterious mutation. So uh, such a unique origin model could have sort of less problem with inbreeding depression. And then we have also interbreeding with Neanderthals. Uh, uh, According to the Out of Africa model, the human and Neanderthal lineages split 500,000 years ago, and then they interbreed again, very much more recently. Then you can ask questions whether it's possible to have fertile children, things like that. I'm not a biologist, I'm raising these questions. So, and you have less problems with these kinds of models if you have a, uh, when, uh, if you have unique origin model where Adam and Eve lived quite recently. So, uh, Let's just end saying that, to my view, this unique origin model makes more sense theologically, because then mankind is unique. We are very unique from all other uh, species, uh, because God created us unique then, with, uh, from scratch, with uh, one genome for Adam and one for, for, uh, for uh, Eve. And it's also that uh, God created Adam and Eve as man and woman, so uh, 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 sexes, they did not evolve over time, but that was from the beginning created by God. So that gives sort of uh, motivation for family and, and, and all, all, uh, all these things. And then also the fall of man was a literal event. It, actually some researchers are Christians who advocate theistic evolution, they also say that it could, it's possible to have the fall of man as a literal event, even in that model. But uh, for me, there are different, for me at least, it's, it's, it's important that the fall of man is a literal event. In any case, the fall of man is very important because that uh, gives us, tells us why we have fallen into sin and why we need, mankind needs a savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, I will end by just giving a few references. Uh, we have, uh, I can mention, I have these two. We published in 2016 these two papers in, uh, in biocomplexity. Uh, the first paper gives an overview, compares the common descent and unique origin model. And in the second paper, we actually present this uh, a uh, unique origin algorithm and Andrew Deuce is currently he has implemented this and he's validating it on real data and then we have two chapters on in this book theistic evolution the scientific philosophical and theological critique that came out less uh, last year so thank you very much for your attention thank you. Thank you.